Hello everyone, my name is Nathan Ernest Noble. I'm a quantum computing applications researcher at IBM Quantum. And today I'm gonna to be giving two lectures, the first of which is this, uh, the quantum hardware introduction. Uh, so in this talk, I really am hoping to give you a sense of some of the details behind quantum hardware and how one can generally design quantum hardware um, and a few other things. So jumping into the details of the overview of my talk, uh, we're going to start off first by giving a brief review of superconducting qubits and this idea of circuit quantum electrodynamics, which is the paradigm that we use to realize quantum computers at IBM. I'm then going to discuss an uh, overview of some typical device errors and uh, within a few of these, highlight the details on them as well as some error mitigation strategies that you can use to sort of reduce the impact that these will have on whatever quantum circuit you're trying to run. And then I'll finish off discussing this idea of quantum process tomography, which is a way in which you can sort of measure the quality of your gates, um, specifically trying to point out how this might be relevant to some of the things that we have for the quantum lab coming up. I just wanted to say trying to give a quantum hardware introduction in one hour is quite a feat. Um, one that I don't really intend to do in the utmost detail. So really what I hope to do in this talk is give you a sense of the, the forest of uh, quantum hardware. And so you can sort of see all the different varieties of things that exist out there uh, and then hopefully point you in the right direction for resources if you care to really dive in and understand the details a bit more. So to that end, um, in our global summer school from last year, Zlat Gomenev uh, gave a fantastic set of lectures consisting of six hours of uh, material. Um, and so much of what I'll be talking was touched on in, in some of his lectures, so I will try and point you to them uh, whenever it is appropriate. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump into this first thing of reviewing superconducting qubits and this idea of circuit QED. So, uh, superconducting qubits um, are made from superconducting circuits. Uh, of these circuits, there are sort of three essential components that really we use to build up a variety of different flavors of superconducting qubits. The first is just going to be a capacitor. Uh, so how the capacitor ends up being realized can be done in a variety of different ways. Here on the figure, I've shown one such realization where it's a coplanar capacitor. So you have two metal plates that sort of exist next to each other. And it's the dimensions of these plates and um, the, the material that they're sitting on that will ultimately dictate what amount of capacitance they have. Then at the bottom here, I have some, descript some mathematical description of the Hamiltonian. So namely the number of charge on these plates, uh, Q squared divided by the two times the capacitance will give you a sense of the, the Hamiltonian or the energy of the system. Moving on, the next element that we're going to want in our super superconducting qubits is this idea of an inductor. Um, inductors generally are realized through taking a meandering wire uh, and it's the length of that wire that largely dictates the, the amount of inductance that you will have, um, as well as the material properties of it. For its uh, Hamiltonian description, we have the inductance on the bottom again, two times the inductance. And at the top, you have the amount of flux sort of uh, going through this inductor here. Now, the next essential component is going to be this idea of a Joseph's injunction. So a Joseph's injunction is the only known uh, lossless nonlinear inductive element. Uh, and there are many different ways in which you can actually realize a Joseph's injunction. The, the popular one to use for superconducting qubits is going to be a superconductor insulator superconductor barrier. And that sort of uh, sandwich of superconductor with an insulator in between um, will be the thing that actually creates the Joseph's injunction for you. And here I have a, a picture of one such realization where you have a superconducting lead sort of coming here. Um, and then on the bottom, you have another superconducting lead. And then in between these two, you have an aluminum oxide layer that separates those two uh, um, aluminum superconducting leads. And it is this sort of stack here that actually ends up giving you the desired Joseph's injunction that you wish to have. Um, and then at the bottom now, you can uh, very clearly see this EJ. This is the, the Josephson energy. Uh, and this is actually related to an idea of an inductance, uh, a nonlinear inductance. And in Zlatko's talks from last year, he actually points out how you can derive what the sort of linear inductance of this is and then go to higher orders to see what higher orders of inductance you actually have from some Josephson juncture like this. And then importantly, the nonlinear component as well is this cosine of phi, 
where you actually have a, a phase, the, the phi being the phase across this junction here. Now, these are sort of the three essential components to actually realize superconducting qubits. And what we're going to do now is begin to look at what happens when you combine them in different ways. So to start, let's take the two linear elements, namely the capacitor and the inductor here, and combine those. So when we do that, we're going to combine, and this will actually give us rise, give rise to a simple harmonic oscillator, one of the physicists' favorite uh, sort of toy problems to work with. The bottom here, you can see the Hamiltonian description of this, where you have the charge and phase now, and it's uh, very natively comes together. Um, and then here we have two different realizations of a simple harmonic oscillator. On the left, we have one that's sort of known as a lumped element resonator. So this now has, say, a capacitance um, through this sort of uh, end type shape uh, piece of metal here, and it has some capacitance to ground. And at the bottom, you have a meandering wire, which gives you the inductance. So this is called a lumped element resonator because its resonant frequency is such that um, if you take the characteristic wavelength of that frequency, it is much larger than the size of the device itself. Now, this is important because if the device is too large, you can end up having resonant modes of sort of uh, arising from the physical nature of the device, um, which would not be ideal in the case of trying to make a lumped element resonator. However, you can actually realize it through sort of a CPW coplanar waveguide. Uh, resonator instead, which is sort of shown here, highlighted in this red box. So now it's basically the length of the the um, meandering uh, coplanar waveguide, as well as its boundary conditions that end up giving rise to the resonant frequency for this uh, style of a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, now, this is where I want to point you to um, some lectures from last year, um, which in lecture 17, Zlatko gets into how you can say use Kirchhoff's laws and what I sort of call Newtonian mechanics to uh, analyze the, the motion uh, equations of motion for um, a simple harmonic oscillator like this. And he even gets into, say, Hamiltonian and Lagrangian mechanics, which is a way to sort of, uh, what, which is sort of shown here, where you can see these sort of stable points within uh, the phase space of, of such a device. In doing so, he actually uh, starts to give rise or explanation to a few different things. Um, and then in lecture 18, um, he covers the quantum mechanical version of this. So specifically, he ends up giving a definition of this sense of ladder operators. So this, you'll see in this talk later on, this sense of A's and A daggers, which sort of are operators that help take you up and down some sort of ladder, if you will. Um, and they're sort of known as a second quantization. And he goes into the really, uh, the, the details of what these things actually are. Um, and furthermore, he, he shows how you can derive the sort of discrete quantum energies for such an oscillator and how there's some zero point fluctuations so that even when you're at the lowest possible energy that you can have, there's some slight fluctuations that happen at this point. Now, just jumping to the punchline of what Zlatko gets into in some of his talk from last year is you have this simple harmonic oscillator. When you describe the energy levels of it, what you end up getting is that you have energy levels that are spaced out evenly by h bar omega. So 0, 1 is the same frequency as uh, 1, 2, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, a, going to be a very useful tool, um, as we'll see in a bit, but um, one might be tempted to try and make a, a qubit out of this, except you'll end up running into the issue that is, if you try and drive on your 0, 1 transition of this oscillator, you're inherently going to drive on the 1, 2, the, in the 2, 3, and instead of giving coherent control of the 0 and the 1 state, you end up driving sort of what's known as a Fox state, where you actually just end up getting photons that sort of populate this resonator. So this isn't necessarily uh, the end all be all in the sense that now what we're going to do is we're actually going to try and uh, create a situation where the higher energy levels have a different spacing. We'll be doing this by taking, as one might be able to uh, guess, is taking this linear inductive element and replacing it with this nonlinear Joseph's injunction. When you do that, you get, you give rise to what is sort of known as a charge base um, qubit. Um, here I'm saying a charge base and harmonic oscillator, um, which is the way in which we realize transmon qubits at IBM. 
So the energy for this uh, or the Hamiltonian to describe this is uh, shown here where you have some sort of uh, capacitive energy times um, N squared where N is now your number operator. It's this A dagger A operator um, times uh, or minus this EJ of cosine arising from the Josephson junction. This here could be derived say from uh, doing some uh, similar things say in uh, Kirchhoff's laws where you actually sort of um, take into account the, the energy going across the loops here. Um, and Zlatko very nicely goes into some of these details in his talk. The physical realization that comes in two different flavors for this. One is that I've shown here is sort of known as a 2D transmon qubit um, in which your readout resonator is in this sort of coplanar or lumped element style that I showed you earlier. Um, and then you can sort of see the transmon here where you have uh, two large capacitor pads and then in the middle here, uh, it's not too easy to see, but there's a Josephson junction connecting these two. Um, now, there is a different way in which you can also realize um, these sort of char charge based qubits um, and that's in this sort of 3D style. So, namely, um, instead of using those coplanar resonators or the lumped element resonators to realize your um, simple harmonic oscillator, what you'll do is actually realize it through a, a physical box. And so it'll be the dimensions of that box that actually end up giving rise to your sort of resonant frequency. You use that as your readout resonator, and then now you're going to put some qubit inside here is shown as this. So here you have two large capacitor pads, and again, some Josephson junctions shunting them there. And then it's in this way that you can get uh, make a 3D transmon qubit instead. Um, and here I've sort of pointed to the paper where they first realized this. One thing that was really nice about these 3D transmons is that they actually end up um, putting a lot of the electric fields inside some vacuum, um, which ends up helping improve the quality of your qubit, uh, at least when it first started. So, and there's been a lot of improvements in this sort of 2D style in which we've actually um, ended up doing quite well and can get very good quality qubits, even in the 2D uh, fashion, which I'll discuss in a second. And as I mentioned, uh, Zlatko in lecture 19 really gets into the details of this transmon qubit, um, how you can derive the Josephson inductance and then really uh, derive that transmon Hamiltonian. Now I want to point out, you don't necessarily have to have just a single junction. You can have two junctions when you do this. Uh, what you end up now doing is having a tunable squid loop right here. Squid loop in this case stands for superconducting quantum interference device. Um, and if you again shut, shunt the squid loop with some capacitor, you end up realizing a tunable charge based um, qubit. In, in the case where now your EJ is tunable by sort of uh, piercing it with some external magnetic field. Um, this here is an image of such a device. Uh, and also what I just wanted to point out is you can get quite um, um, elaborate in how you design these devices. So you can see that the capacitive element for this is designed very differently than what you've seen in some of the previous slides. Uh, but then right here you have one junction in another junction. And then this here is the loop that uh, allows you to sort of begin to tune the Josephson energy there. Uh, this is a very interesting device. There, there is one downside once you have this sort of external loop, or sorry, when you have this loop in which you can pierce it with an external magnetic field, you become very susceptible to uh, a larger set of noise sources. Um, when I was in grad school and sort of uh, working to build these sorts of devices, uh, it, it's actually a, a quite impressive how sensitive these things can be in the sense that I can take, uh, uh, if we didn't shield our, our device properly, we'd end up seeing that when you walk in the room and you take your phone, you could wave your phone around like 10 feet away and you can actually see this cause the, the qubit frequency to sort of shift around due to the magnets that are sitting inside your phone. So this uh, shows and says that you have to take a lot of care when designing and considering what sorts of qubits you're going to use. Uh, in the case of what we do at IBM, we always stick with fixed frequency transmons, which helps improve the, the underlying coherence of them. I'll touch on this a bit later. When doing this, it actually ends up changing some of the, the native gates uh, that you can actually realize, particularly two qubit gates. Um, so I've, I've elaborated on this Josephson junction a bit and how it ends up being this nonlinear element. Um, and that is an essential ingredient, this nonlinear inductance in order to realize qubits. 
But I just want to point out that you can actually begin to do some interesting engineering of these junctions themselves. So, namely, we have this Josephson junction, which is very small here. If instead we take this Josephson junction and make it a bit larger, what you can actually end up realizing is what is known as a superinductance. So, namely, take um, this junction, make it larger, and then now have a chain of large junctions like this. And now what you'll do is you'll have effectively a linear inductance that is much larger than what you'd get for some equivalent, uh, for some wire with an equivalent length. So this superinductance ends up allowing you to get um, sort of 10,000 times as much inductance compared to some wire is a, a rough number here. Now, what's interesting about this is you can take this and actually end up engineering a different sort of qubit known as the fluxonium qubit. Um, where you take a Josephson junction and shunt it by this large uh, inductance here. Um, here I've pointed to uh, uh, um, one of the episodes from our Kiskit seminar series in which Prof Professor Vladimir Manchurian from University of Maryland actually discusses some of his work with this fluxonium qubit. During his time in grad school, he was the one to uh, realize the initial experimental or had the uh, initial experimental really. Blah, blah, blah. In his time in grad school, he was one of the folks who had uh, initially realized this qubit experimentally. Um, and this is uh, something that I had the opportunity to work on a bit in grad school as well. Um, and it's a very interesting device for, for a lot of different reasons. Um, now, here, I just want to point out that you can end up taking um, these four different uh, elements. I've sort of added this uh, fourth one here of a superinductor. And by doing so, you can realize a variety of different qubits um, that sort of fit this uh, circuit style here, where you have either a capacitor, an inductor, or, uh, an inductor, or a Josephson junction. Um, when you, depending on how you combine these elements, you are going to take the energy landscape that your quantum states actually exist in, and you're going to adjust it. And so when I uh, just a moment ago spoke of this idea of using fluxoniums to generate interesting uh, properties, one of those things is that you can create an energy landscape that allows you to create uh, sort of quantum states that are sort of robust to noise. Now, in this same spirit, you can, um, something that's started to recently happen, which is quite exciting, is you can take this uh, somewhat simple circuit style, in which you say have two nodes, um, and you can make it a bit more complex. Namely, you can get into this idea of a zero pi qubit, in which now instead of two nodes, you end up having four nodes. And this zero pi qubit is uh, designed to be inherently robust to all sorts of noise, both for its T1 and its T2 properties, which I'll explain what those are if, just in case you don't know what it is. Um, in, in the same vein, uh, for this zero pi qubit, uh, in our Kiskit seminar series, we have gradu a graduate student from Princeton, Pranav Mundata, who ends up speaking about some of his work for realizing this device. Um, he also touches on some interesting things about fluxonium qubits. Now, I've very quickly jumped through all these different qubits that have sort of come into existence, um, and I didn't necessarily get into the details. Uh, what I want to do, though, is I really want to point you to some resources where you can find these. So, namely, there's uh, I, I made great use of this during my time in grad school, but there's this uh, GitHub repo for superconducting qubits designed by Gens Koch, who is one of the, uh, uh, he's a professor at Northwestern and one of the pioneers of many of the, of much of the research in this area, um, as well as one of his post or older postdocs, uh, Peter. Um, so they have this repo. In this repo, you can go and look at the different qubits, study what their environment looks like, the, the energy landscape that they exist in, and, and see some of the interesting properties. You can say and begin to understand how different energy levels couple together and some of the details that I unfortunately don't have the time to get into today. Uh, with that said, though, what I want to do is take a step back and, and look at the elements that we're using at IBM Quantum for our hardware. So specifically, we are going to speak about the transmon qubit. So it's a Josephson junction shunted by a large capacitance and then this simple harmonic oscillator. So I want to now explain this idea of circuit QED and how that's important for readout in our devices. Uh, just for the sake of ease, I'm going to change these Hamiltonians a bit. 
um, in which before I was talking with um, sort of operators of Q and phi, um, here instead for the simple harmonic oscillator, I'm going to rewrite that in terms of these A daggers and A, so these ladder operators. Um, if you're unfamiliar with what this, this is, please do, do go refer to Zlatko's talk from last year. Um, and then for my transmog qubit, for the sake of simplicity right now, I'm just going to approximate it as a two-level system. Um, it, it is important to know that it's not a two-level system, and this ends up coming up in some of the uh, details that I'll mention in the next lecture, actually, uh, when you start to think about the control of your device. And it'll also be important in this lecture when thinking about readout set. Um, so now what I'm going to do is couple these two devices together. So here I've coupled it in some capacitive manner where I have a capacitor now that sort of allows these two things to, to speak to each other. And it is this idea right here that is the, the paradigm of circuit quantum electrodynamics. Um, so circuit quantum electrodynamics is the circuit equivalent of cavity QED. Cavity QED winning the Nobel Prize by Sir Charos and Dave Wineland um, some number of years ago. Um, to describe this sort of system, you can describe it with this, what is known as a James Cummings Hamiltonian, which is written here. So just walking through each one of these elements, you have the, the resonant frequency of your readout resonator. So that's omega R. So it's H bar omega R ends up getting the energy of that. Um, then here you have omega Q times sigma Z for your qubit. And then now you have these other terms of chi. So this chi, is dependence on the coupling that uh, arises from this capacitive element here. Um, and it is sort of proportional in some sense to how strongly coupled these two things are. What I want to point out that's important about this element chi is that um, your effective, uh, once you've coupled these systems together, the effective resonant frequency of your, your readout resonator here is now actually going to depend on the state of your qubits, this sigma z. So if your qubit's pointing down um, or in the uh, zero state, it'll, your readout resonator will have one frequency. And then if it's pointing in the other direction or in the one state, you'll end up shifting what that frequency is. So what that ends up looking like in the physical sense is that you have some readout resonator, as you see here. This is that uh, CPW style uh, resonator. Um, and in which both uh, there's sort of open boundary conditions here. And then now you have a qubit that sits here. This happens to be a diagram for a flux tunable qubit, and it's uh, capacitively coupled to this uh, transmission line. Now, when you send in a tone, if your qubit's in one state, you'll get, say, a, a lot of signal going through. But if your qubit ends up being in the, uh, the one state, what you'll end up finding is that you actually don't get much transmission through this. And it's through this that you can then determine um, the, the state of your qubit or the sigma z. Um, putting this in sort of um, form in which you can see the transmission, um, here the x-axis now is the frequency, and then the y is the amount of transmission or the cavity population that you have. Um, so if your qubit's in one state, you'll see uh, transmission peak at one frequency, and if your qubit's in another state, you'll see your transmission peak at another. It's in this way now, if you, uh, say, probe at this frequency right here, if you have very little transmission, then you know your qubit's in the one state, and if you have a lot of transmission, you know your qubit's in the two state. So this is the paradigm of circuit QED. Earlier I mentioned that, hey, we can't use this uh, simple harmonic oscillator as our qubit. But as you can see, it still ends up being very useful. One, it's going to serve as the way that we actually read out the state of our qubits. But very importantly, what this resonator does is it helps isolate the qubit from the environment. So it sort of does a better job at ensuring that it doesn't interact with the environment. And in this way, you're gonna get better T1s and better T2s. Um, and overall, it's just gonna allow you to um, be able to do more with these quantum devices. Um, within our si systems at IBM, we also use this linear resonator as a way to couple two qubits together. Um, and this will ultimately lead to our cross-residence interaction, which I'll discuss uh, in depth in the next lecture, but I'll touch on it in just a moment here. Now, um, in terms of giving a bit of an uh, overview of different sorts of superconducting qubits, I want to take a moment and rearrange this Hamiltonian that we have here. So 
I, it's the exact same terms that were there, but instead what I've done is I've kept my omega R and I sort of isolated it. And instead now look at the impact for, on my qubit alone. What you can see now when you write it in this way is that what your qubit frequency ends up being um, depends on the number of photons inside your resonator. So this is interesting because you can actually now resolve um, individual photons that exist inside this resonator. So this was some of the work done by Dave Schuster, who's a professor at the University of Chicago. And this is reference to his paper in which now you can see these number of resolved peaks. So depend, so the X axis here is going to say be the, the qubit frequency that you're probing at. And then this uh, Y axis gives you a sense as to um, what, how much your, your qubit actually is occupying this frequency in a sense. Now, what you can see is if you have zero photons inside your resonator, you're going to have one uh, resonant frequency. And if you have one, it shifts two, and so on and so forth. Now, I bring this up because if you're in this number resolved uh, state, um, or if you have a sort of number resolved setup for your qubit, this will actually be uh, useful in getting, uh, making that linear oscillator actually a qubit. Uh, what I mean to say is that there exists this idea of uh, snap gates, they're called, so selective number dependent arbitrary phase gates. By do using this sort of gate here, you can actually end up getting uh, coherent control of the photons inside this cavity. So this on the right is a transmon qubit, coupled to some uh, uh, large or some sort of 3D-like cavity. The cavity in this case, the frequency is set by the dimensions of this pin at the bottom. Um, but by using this, you can actually now uh, actually make that uh, uh, harmonic oscillator and have coherent control over it. So earlier I said you couldn't have coherent control of the cavity. That's true until you introduce this sort of transmon element that allows you to begin to get control over this. So these are sort of uh, the, the world of cat codes or cat qubits often. Um, again, pointing to some resources in case you're interested to look into this more, um, we have uh, several uh, episodes from our seminar series in which we discuss uh, this sort of approach to superconducting qubits. Now, I touched on this idea of measurements and how you can discriminate, say, between your zero state and your one state. And I just want to put this into the language of Qiskit a little bit. Um, so, reviewing uh, the way that we measure our qubits is you are first going to drive your qubit um, at uh, its frequency, and then you measure uh, the readout resonator, or you measure the state of your qubit by probing the readout resonator in the way that I discussed before. So, when operating at the quantum circuit level, uh, this sort of count comes back to you as a result of a zero or a one state. Um, and this now in, in the context of Qiskit pulse is sort of known as measurement level two. Um, this is not actually what happens in, in the sense that in order to get whether you have a zero or a one, you have to do some analysis on uh, the, the microwave tone that you send in. So specifically, if you move down to say measurement level one, what you can see is that this here now is an IQ plot in which we're plotting the real and imaginary components of the, the microwave tone that you're sending into your readout designator. When you do that, you end up getting sort of these two different centroids here, where if your qubit's in the zero state, you end up having a blob over here, and if your qubit's in the one, you end up having a, a centroid in this area. And it's in this way that you actually end up uh, classifying whether your qubit's in the zero or one state. And you can say use classical machine learning to, or, or a variety of techniques if you wish um, to actually uh, sort of create a discriminator of sorts that classifies whether your qubit's zero or classifies if it's one. Now, this here is measurement level one in which we've taken this tone. It has some characteristic duration and we've just taken the time average of, of that tone. Um, something that we hope to make available uh, one day is this idea of measurement level zero, where you can actually see those time dynamics explicitly. So this is the review, sort of very quick review of superconducting qubits um, and how it is that you realize different sorts of elements. Uh, with that, I now want to uh, get into some of the typical errors that you will find in quantum hardware and uh, for a few of those, touch on how you can actually uh, mitigate the impact of those errors.
So let's get into to that now. Um, so at a very high level, I've listed four different sorts of errors that you often run into. One is this thing that I've mentioned a few times, namely T1s and T2s. Uh, there's going to be this readout error. Um, more generally, it's actually state preparation and measurement error. Spam error is what it's often referred to as. Uh, then you could say have gate error. So you're trying to control these qubits. Uh, um, your controls will have imperfections associated with them. Uh, and um, that is something that is important when trying to uh, build a fault tolerant quantum computer. And then this last one is, I think, something that will be at least somewhat more familiar with to folks, which is this idea of shot um, error. So basically, getting a, a good number of measurements to have strong statistics of, of your system here. Now, on the right, I've listed uh, general mitigation strategies. Uh, so Richardson extrapolation, I don't have uh, time to talk about it today. But this is the essence of trying to intentionally amplify errors or amplify noise um, in your system in a careful manner, such that you can actually use it as a way to extrapolate back to some zero, uh, some ideal, ideal zero noise results. Readout errors. Um, here, there are two different ways that, that you can do it. So excited state promoted readout is one in this essence of an A matrix. Um, for gate errors, really just the engineering of the gates themselves is the way in which you try and suppress um, any sort of errors coming from this. Uh, and this ends up getting tied to hardware in a certain way, which I'll have to discuss about. And then um, this last one, I think uh, it's maybe not explicitly an error mitigation strategy, uh, but it is uh, in the same vein, in which you can be clever about the way in which you measure your system um, in, or measure the Hamiltonian of interest that you're or trying to study, say, for example, to actually uh, get better results um, in this, uh, the number of shots that you have to take. For the talk today, I'm going to focus on the ones that are highlighted in purple. Um, so starting off, let's get into this idea of T1 and T2, in case you're unfamiliar. So T1, um, is just getting into this essence of you have discrete energy levels. I'm going to take my uh, qubit from the zero state and put it into the one. And how long is it that I, so I take it, it starts off in the ground state, I pump it to the excited state in some fashion, then I wait and see how long it takes to decay. It is this essence that gives you the T1. The T2 um, is often referred to as the coherence time. This is where you take your qubit that's in the ground state. You say it can pu pulse it to the equator. Um, and how long is it before you are no longer able to read out that superposition state? Now, how is it that we actually go about measuring these two properties? So for the T1, what you're going to do is just, as I said a second ago, you're gonna take your qubit and pump it into the excited state with this idea of a pi pulse. You wait some period of time and then you measure it. And then you do this uh, experiment for a variety of delays of delta T here. And then this is going to have some exponential decay curve associated with it. So you fit it um, to that uh, exponential decay. And once you re reach sort of one over X, uh, one over E of that value, then that's going to be your characteristic T1. For your T2, you're gonna do this essence of a pi over two pulse where you're gonna take your qubit and um, put it to the equator. You wait some period of time, and then you end up uh, doing another pi over two pulse and read your uh, read out the state of your qubit. When you do this, you're going to end up having these sorts of oscillations. These oscillations here are known as Ramsey oscillations. Uh, it is through these that you measure. Uh, in the way that I've drawn it here, you're actually measuring your T2 star. There's a variety of different T2s, uh, T2 star, T2 echo, um, but I'm not going to get into the details on that too much. In the next lecture, I'm going to talk about how you can actually uh, get this pi or pi over two pulse and how you can calibrate it and how you can do both rough calibrations as well as fine calibrations. Um, however, at this point in time, what I want to really get to is these T1 and T2 properties um, are inherently the, the thing that limits us from being able to do interesting work with quantum computers or to have a fault tolerant quantum computers. Those paired with those gate errors that I mentioned earlier. Um, so what is great about superconducting qubits is that we've had steady improvement in both of these properties um, throughout the year. So from the initial realization in which the coherence times were very short to now reaching values that are much faster or much larger.
In this, I just want to point out a few things. So, namely, there's this idea of circuit QED. Um, you can see that this was one thing that sort of isolated the qubit from the environment and consequently improved the T1 and T2s. Um, and then, say, here you have this transmon element, which is taking um, what is known as a Cooper pair box, where you have uh, so the Cooper pair box is one of the charge based qubits on um, which you have a Joseph's injunction shunted or with some capacitance. When you make that capacitance very large, you end up actually existing in this transmon uh, limit. And then you can see a variety of other things as well. I also want to point out that uh, that paper was from back in 2013. Uh, just last year, this uh, review of the current state of superconducting qubits. Uh, was published in which you can see a continued improvement for these different sorts of devices. Not only that, what I think is exciting is that we really haven't reached a fund fundamental limit in our T1s and T2s. Uh, so just a few weeks ago, um, or maybe a month ago at the time of this viewing, um, you can see that Jay posted a very exciting announcement for our fixed frequency transmons in which we actually end up getting above a millisecond for our T1. And I think the T2 ended up being about a millisecond as well. Um, so now what, what's really leading to all these improvements um, in this? I, I really liked this uh, question here. What enabled this material filtering geometry or voodoo um, in J all of the above? Uh, so it really is exist uh, to, to improve these T ones. There's a whole variety of factors that I haven't even had the chance to touch on coming from the design of the qubit itself, the materials that you're using to make that qubit, as well as a whole set of uh, control electronics or filtering that really go down inside that fridge um, that you may have seen in the past. Now, a very important thing that I wanna point out is that your T1s and T2s are not inherently constant in the sense that they will fluctuate over time they're sensitive to a variety of factors. So uh, if you say don't um, do a good job at keeping the dilution refrigerator cold that keeps these qubits down at say 15 millikelvin, and if that warms up, then you can start to see fluctuations in your qubits here. Or if your control electronics start to have issues, they can actually introduce noise into your qubits and cause fluctuations. So these T1s and T2s are not something that are stable. And this is gonna be particularly important say when you're trying to do uh, say, readout error mitigation, which I'm going to touch on next, um, in the sense that you have to keep in mind that these things will fluctuate over time, and so this will introduce fluctuations in whatever results you're trying to get in your quantum hardware. So getting into readout errors, uh, I'm going to first just give a sense as to what the, the readout errors are, and then I'm going to touch on this idea of an A matrix, and maybe I can briefly mention what the excited state promoted readout is. So for readout errors, this is basically saying that you are, are having misclassifications of, of the state that you sort of expected. They, and, and here, I, I, as I alluded to earlier, there's this sense of state preparation and measurement errors. So you can, um, for a variety of reasons, say not do perfect at having your qubit be in the zero state to start. That's generally you want it to start there. Um, this say can happen if, as I was just saying, if the temperature of your fridge rises too much, you can actually cause your qubit to be in the excited state just through thermal excitations to the excited state. So in this, um, to see what, what that actually looks like, if you sort of squint your eyes, you can see, say, that there's a blue dot, which is supposed to correspond to the zero state, but it actually ends up being in this one cluster. So this might be a state preparation error here. The uh, other side of this say is that um, you have measurement errors um, where I'm going to get into one nature uh, of measurement errors um, in which now here I have, say, some measurement pulse at the bottom. So I'm going to have some amplitude and some characteristic duration. But what you'll see is that I'm, what I'm going to start to do is just mess around with uh, keep the amplitude of this fixed and change the duration of my measurement pulse. So if I make my measurement pulse very short, um, for this specific tuning that I, uh, the calibration that I had for the measurement pulse, um, you can see that these two centroids begin to come close together. So now this actually will end up causing um, a, a, a lot of, a large amount of errors in your readout in the sense that you are not able to well resolve whether you're in your zero state or your one state because those two uh, sort of centroids have come very close together. 
but you can see in, in the center one that I, as I increased the duration of my pulse, those centroids became well resolved. So you might have this impression that if I then say just in, uh, continue to increase my uh, pulse duration indefinitely, that I'll end up getting perfect readout. But it's actually quite the opposite in the sense that is as you begin to increase the duration of your pulse, what you can actually end up doing is getting T1 decay during your readout pulse. So this is where your qubit actually will start in the one state during your measurement, but because you took too long for your measurement, it ends up decaying to the zero state and then you end up classifying it as such. Um, so this is actually one way in which that sense of excited state promoted readout can be useful and that you can um, take your qubit, push it to the, one of the excited states, and then in this sense, you, you somewhat extend the lifetime of your qubit. Um, and I can discuss what, how that actually works. Now, another way that you can do this is through the sense of an A matrix. So for your A matrix here, what you are going to do is you're going to create or you're going to run a set of circuits. Um, so if you have n qubits um, and you wanted the full matrix, you would run two to the n circuits in which you are going to prepare the variety of combinations of these different circuits. Um, so when doing so, if everything behaves sort of in an ideal sense, uh, so you would prepare these two to the n states, um, which is two to the n different quantum circuits, um, then you're going to perform m shots on them. And then from this, you construct this sort of matrix here. If it was behaving in the ideal way that you'd want it to, you'd end up seeing that it's a, a diagonal matrix with zeros everywhere else. However, because of state preparation errors or measurement errors, you'll see that you get non-zero elements in the off-diagonal uh, components. Now, this is the, the way in which you can begin to characterize that A matrix. You can uh, essentially invert this matrix um, and then from that, you can uh, improve any sorts of results that you're going to have on your quantum hardware. So this is the essence of readout error mitigation, um, at least in the context of what's built into Qiskit, um, this complete mesh cow, as it's called, I believe. Now, um, just to show you how this ends up working is you take your calibration matrix here. Um, if you don't do any sort of correction, you get these blue bars here where what we're trying to do is say, create the G8Z state. So 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1. Um, but you can see that there exists a set of errors here that keep it from being the ideal 50, 50 uh, in your 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1. Um, but once you apply the mitigated results, you can see that you uh, end up greatly improving this. Now, two things I wanna bring out. One, you have to be aware of scaling here. So you have to run those two to the end circuits. So it's in this way that this technique isn't necessarily a scalable solution in the, the fault tolerant sense. So for example, if you tried to run this on our 65 qubit system, um, you would have some issues actually inverting that matrix there. Um, and then another important thing to consider is the fact that this uh, those T1 fluctuations that I mentioned earlier will lead to fluctuations in your A matrix here. So this is something that's important to consider. So if you want sort of the, the best results that you can get, it can often be useful to uh, calibrate this matrix on some regular occurrence or near the time of the execution of your circuit that you're trying to run. Now, this is just one readout error mitigation technique. There exists others like this excited state promoted readout that I mentioned, as well as a variety of other ones that um, you can try and use. Um, but now I want to move on to gate errors. Uh, so I'm not going to get into it too much, but what I want to do is point you to this uh, resource here. Um, this is again from that paper last year in which it's a review of sort of the state of superconducting qubits. In this, they bring up a variety of different qubits, um, the initial years in which they, that uh, specific sort of two qubit gate interaction uh, was realized, as well as the highest achieved fidelity for them. Um, so I, I am specifically pointing out two qubits because, uh, or two qubit gates, because it is two qubit uh, gates that end up being the largest source of error most often. Um, and so, and it's, it's in this way that they are sort of one of the biggest limitations um, when trying to run quantum circuits. Um, there are also single qubit gates and how you characterize those will be something that uh, we'll discuss in just a second. Um, but something I want to point out is that the style of your hardware will influence what sort of native gates you can realize. 
So if you say have tunable transmons, you can end up realizing say a CZ type gate um, somewhat natively. Um, in, in fixed frequency transmon qubits, uh, you have to do a, a little bit more work. Or instead say now you can have this tunable coupling bus here that allows you to realize a different sort of I swap gate. So this, this really just goes to say that the design of the hardware is going to influence what sort of two qubit gate that you have, especially. Now at IBM, we're using the cross resonance interaction. At a very high level, the way that this works is you have two qubits and you're gonna drive one qubit at the frequency of the other, and this will lead to a two qubit gate. In the next talk, I'll actually get into the details of how you uh, use this uh, interaction and how you can actually say build a uh, excuse me, build a C not gate from such an interaction. Now, these are just a variety of different gates that you have. Uh, what I want to highlight is that they're going to be imperfect in some way. And so this means that you have to actually measure them in some sense and measure the quality of your gate. I'll touch on two ways in which we can do that. One is this idea of randomized benchmarking. So the essence of randomized benchmarking is that you are going to take gates that are from a Clifford group. The reason that we're using the Clifford group is that it's actually easy to simulate. Um, and, and that'll be important in the sense that you, what you'll do is you'll apply a series of gates that coming from this Clifford group, because it's easy to simulate, you'll sort of calculate its inverse, uh, and then apply the inverse such that you ultimately get the identity. So you, you, whatever state you have coming in should be the state that you have coming out. Now, when you do this, if you have perfect gates with perfect qubits, you end up seeing, say, if you started off in the zero state, that um, you would always, in this plot here, be sort of a, a boring flat line up at one. However, your qubits are imperfect as well as your gates, and then now you'll begin to see that you decay in this way. And now there can be a variety of ways in which you actually end up doing this randomized benchmarking. Um, we have some resources that discuss uh, some different methods that exist uh, for randomized benchmarking. Here, just pointing out, um, there can be leakage randomized benchmarking, which is a way to actually describe how much you've leaked outside of your zero one state into higher energy states. So if you try to make very fast pulses, this can be quite important. Um, if you wanted to characterize the quality of a specific gate, you can do this essence of interleaved randomized benchmarking, where in between each one of these, you're going to interleave the target gate of interest. And there's many others that exist in, in this space of randomized benchmarking. And, and a recent thing I've seen uh, being developed is this essence of cycle benchmarking, where instead of taking from the Clifford group, you take from the Pali group. Now, um, this is a useful way to characterize gates, particularly as it is robust to those spam uh, errors that I mentioned. Um, but I still want to point out a different way in which you can measure gates, uh, which comes down to this idea of quantum process tomography. So quantum process tomography and quantum state tomography end up being equivalent in some sense. What that basically is saying is that I have some unitary that I wish to enact on my uh, my qubit or on my system, but I want to actually test what, so I, I have the ideal unitary that I wish to implement, but I want to test what unitary I actually end up implementing. To do this, you, you do quantum process tomography. The essence of this is that you are going to have a set of state preparations uh, that you do, and you're going to have a, uh, some measurements uh, preparations that you do. So you always end up measuring in sort of your Z basis for your qubits, uh, but then there's ways that you can sort of map uh, this to your X basis or your Y basis. So for a one qubit example, say you are going to prepare these four different states here. So your zero state, your one state, and then the sort of plus and minus states on the equator of your block sphere. And then you measure in the three different bases of X, Y, and Z. Uh, for, the, for a one qubit instance, this is going to require 12 circuits. Um, when you go to two qubits, you actually end up scaling up to a larger number of circuits. Um, this will be an exercise in the lab notebook to say, to, uh, determine precisely how many you actually are going to do. But so once you've done this, you can reconstruct uh, the unitary that you've sort of implemented on your quantum hardware. Um, and, and something that we also will point out in the lab is that this sort of quantum process tomography is very sensitive to those spam errors. So when doing QPT, you definitely benefit from using freed out error mitigation.
But once you've constructed this unitary, um, you can then get an essence of what sort of quality gates you're having. Mainly it's through this idea of a fidelity in which you're going to take um, sort of the daggered version of the ideal unitary that you wish to have and multiply it by the one that you actually measured from your quantum process tomography. Then you're going to take the trace of the product of those two and then normalize by the uh, dimensions here. So this ends up giving you a value of one if you've done a perfect gate. Um, here I point again to some resources where you can actually look at tutorials that exist for uh, tomography of all sorts, uh, as well as some papers. Um, so say this is the Kiskit Pulse paper where you can actually use say quantum process tomography to measure the coupling strength um, between two different qubits say. And then this paper here is uh, talking about some of the details of uh, quantum process tomography and how you can actually uh, use it to measure the state of your qubit. So this is the conclusion of this part of my uh, uh, of this lecture. Um, just as a quick recap, we reviewed different superconducting qubit architectures, going from transmon qubits to tunable transmons, uh, to fluxoniums, to zero pies, or these sort of bosonically encoded cap qubits. Um, we've discussed this idea of circuit QED and how it, um, how you can do qubit readout within this space. And then we've touched on a few different uh, errors that we have and how you can uh, mitigate them, as well as the fact that these errors are inherently something that will fluctuate over time. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. Please do feel free to reach out with any questions. I believe there will be some sort of chat um, and I'll definitely be active within there. Uh, thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you more soon.